This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius Satellite Channel 159 across North America, and from PRI, Public Radio International in the United States. Well, it's been an extraordinary life for Jane Fonda, on screen as an Oscar and Emmy Award-winning actor, on the international stage as a peace activist and feminist, and on her feet, revolutionizing the way women work out. But at age 73, Jane Fonda says all those roles were just a prelude to the third act of her life, the act that roughly begins at the age 60. Her best-selling 2005 memoir, My Life So Far, took readers behind the scenes of her varied life, her childhood, privileged in some ways, yet overshadowed by the tragic loss of her mother, and a difficult relationship with her distant and legendary actor father, Henry. She's had a career that began almost reluctantly and blossomed into rewarding work as an actor and producer, and later as an entrepreneur and philanthropist, and three challenging marriages to vastly different men. The common thread in all, this was a wholehearted passion. And now Jane Fonda is bringing that same passion to bear on life's third act. Her new book is called Prime Time. It's a physical, spiritual, and practical guide to, as she calls it, successful aging. And Jane Fonda joins me live now in Studio Q. Hello. Hi. What a pleasure it is to see you again. Likewise. Thank you for doing this. Uh, this is, I, I, I was just telling you before we hit the air here that I find this very, um, this book has been a real inspiration to me. You, why? Why? Yeah. Um, because I grapple uh, in my own way with uh, my future and, and getting older and how I'm going to deal with the fact that my life will end. <laughs> and, and I find your book is very affirming you know, on all those counts. Mm-hmm. How's that for an answer? That's good. That's All right. good. Let me ask you, it was I'll ask you a question. For men as, women, as well as women, oh, so I'm, I'm gonna, glad you found it. I'm going to get to that. You, 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 you look back on the first two acts of your life in this book, but you're also looking forward to what's still in store. Tell me, the, tell me about the experience of writing this book compared to your 2005 memoir. Well, it requ- this one uh, required a great deal of research. I spent four years traveling around the country, uh, talking to scientists and doctors and, you know, different, different kind of specialists and all kinds of aspects of aging. Um, I made a list of everything I wanted to know. See, what happened was I was ending my 60s and approaching my 70s, and I realized that I was getting happier. <laughs> That's not what I expected. Right. Because I, you know, I, I, I come from a long line of depressives, so I was sure I was going to get really depressed as I got older. Right. And I discovered when you're inside of aging, as opposed to looking at it from the outside, it's a lot easier. And I wanted to know, am I unique or is this common? And if so, why is nobody talking about it? And, and so the research was the big thing that was different. It's very personal. As you saw, I mean, I, there's a lot of personal stuff in the book, but there's also a great deal of research. When you say you were happier, what, what do you mean by that? You, you got up and you just felt better about your life than you well, had in the past? When I was in my 40s, I'd wake up and my first dozen thoughts would be negative. And now I find I, I almost never get stressed. You know, I, I, I rarely, well, I'm not a fighter anyway f- with people, but you, you know what you need and you know what you don't need, and you what you can just let go, you know. So, so you don't agree with me, okay? But there are other ways that we can be friends. Mm. You see commonalities more than differences. You've been there, you've done that. It didn't kill you, and so you're just you're not as hyper vigilant as when you're younger. Mm. Um, and it's um, it's a very beautiful thing. And I found that. Most well, not just that I found. Studies have been shown that people over fifty tend to get that way. Part of what's fueling uh, your interest, and I guess a societal interest, in this third act, the way you describe it, which is basically from the your sixties onward, yeah, mm-hmm. the last three decades, um, is the fact that our lifespan has changed so much. You call it a longevity longevity revolution. Describe that. What's the longevity well, revolution? Since our great grandparents and grandparents, Americans, maybe Canadians, we live 34 years longer than they did. Mm. Th- that's an entire second adult lifetime added to our lifespan. What are we supposed to do with it? I mean, it's, it becomes even more important to know what we want to do. How do we want to use that time? And, um, you know, I feel strongly that one of the reasons that I have this sense of well-being now is because I did I, I did a memoir, and it I've, turns out it's called something. It's called A Life Review. Mm-hmm. And it's true that in order to know how to go forward, you kind of have to know where you've been. Mm. 
you know, who were you back then? Why were you? What I'm gonna, were let me ask you happen? about the life review in a second. Let me just stick with this uh, longevity revolution because it is part of our issue around the way we see aging as in, in a negative light often. Uh, part of the fact that it's relatively new. I mean, it's it, it's just in the last century that we've gained these 35 years. If, if the lifespan was 46 years or something like that at the turn of the century, uh, the turn of the 20th century, now it's 80 years old or or even older than that for, for women. Mm -hmm. Is that why we have difficulty, do you think, um, coming to terms with uh, seeing aging in a positive way? I don't think so. I think it's people are scared of dying. <laughs> It just freaks people out, not everywhere in the world, but in, in, in my culture, people are scared of mortality, number one. Number two, there's such a premium put on youth, you know, like, like it's some elixir, like it's some answer to something. Right. I wouldn't personally want to go back for anything. But no, I think it's just it's a cult of youth and a fear of death. You wouldn't want to go back for anything. There's this great moment in the book where you say somebody asks you a question and says, uh, uh, um, what, what age do you feel? And this is often a question that gets asked, and you say, well, I could answer in the cliche way and say I feel like I'm in my mid-40s. And in fact, I had Larry King on the show not too long ago, about a year ago, who's of course in his mid-70s, and I asked him that question, and he said, I feel 46. Mm -hmm. you, you answered, I feel 70, yeah. and you're fine with that. Yeah, and I feel 70, and then I quoted Picasso. It takes a long time to become young. <laughs> but also you said, just saying that, you could feel the, the snickers or the, or the uh, dismay of some of the younger people oh, around yeah, like, you. Oh, my God, you don't look that old. Don't tell Don't anybody. tell people. You know, like, like what they have is better than what I have. So tell me about feeling good about telling people then. Well, I mean, it's not that I feel good telling people that. I just, it's my age, and I don't lie about it. And right. so, you know, and... But I feel good now, and I didn't always feel good, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and I wanted to put them in the book, along with other things that I learned that I hadn't known. Um, it can be a wonderful time of life. When our bodies may be failing us, you know, I have a, a new knee and a new hip, and I've had cancer, and, but those things don't define me. Yeah. You know, that's not who I am. Yeah. Part of when I, when I said earlier that I found it affirming, you talk about seeing um, a progression in our lives uh, of getting older as a staircase going upwards, as opposed to an arc where we hit the peak in the middle and then go degenerate after that. Uh, and I find that 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 is very affirming to think, and it makes sense. We just we we do. You have a better perspective, as you say. You you're more sage. You you know yourself better. Mm -hmm. uh, the only downside being that you're physically not able to do mm -hmm. the things you were able to do earlier. How mm -hmm. do you prepare for uh, for the fact that your body isn't going to be able to do what you could do in your 30s or 20s or teens? How do you prepare for that? Well. First of all, and, and I'm glad that young people like you are reading it, which they are, it's good to start when you're young making your body as strong as you can um, because it means that the things that happen later in life will be minimized. I mean, there are certain things that happen no matter what, but if you, if you have stayed physically active and very consciously worked on that, then, then the age-related problems will, will be minimized. But how many people I've met and I interviewed that are seriously ill, you know, like with Lou Gehrig's disease, right. ALS, for example, right. where their body decomposes almost, but the brain remains intact. Their bodies may be going, but they know who they are more. They are becoming stronger in the ways that count in their souls, in their hearts, in their spirits. They may have, they may, they may find their voice for the first time. You know, I, I write about how some of the great artists of all time, Beethoven, sure. Monet, Matisse, Cezanne, and others, did their greatest works when they were almost dead. Beethoven was deaf when right. he wrote his greatest right. works. M you know, M Monet had macular degeneration when he did his great Impressionist paintings. You see essences more you than differences. Do you think we approach aging 
or have different perspectives on aging as uh, in the, between the sexes? Are the men and women uh, uh, does aging affect men, men and women differently? Did you find? I think it's easier for women um, because our whole life is about changing. You know, hormonally, we get we menstruate, we have babies, we give birth. That says, you know, those are all changes. The babies leave and then they come back, and then we go through menopause. I mean, there's we're we're used to change. It used to be we new. change too. Not as much. No. <laughs> now that may over right. time change. Right. You know, more and more women are entering the workforce, and right. we used to live eight years longer than you guys. Now we're only five years longer than you guys. But also, women tend to have a tight social network, a very of intimate friends, more so than men. I mean, men tend there's like their spouse or their partner, yeah. and when the partner or spouse goes they are more bereft than women are because they don't have that network that uh, they have a harder time with intimacy and emotion so it, aging is is easier for women culturally it's you know it's like in my profession as a movie actor you know men stars can be much older than right. women stars right. but in the ways that really matter i think it's easier for for women but the beauty is that men and women become more alike when they get older how so well Estrogen decreases in women in relation to testosterone, mm. and in men, testosterone decreases in relation to estrogen. And so the man becomes more of a, a homebody. A man who may not have been a wonderful father becomes a great-grandfather. Right, 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 right. You know, a woman who used to be, oh, honey, it's okay, I'll take care of you, becomes, I'm going to go to class, would you please take the cleaning out? But there's a, th th there's a coming together that, ha that allows for deeper intimacy than perhaps existed before. Let me ask you about visualizing the future and then what you were talking about a moment, a moment ago, the life review. First of all, throughout this book, you, you say it's important to project yourself into the future. Rehearse. Visualize, rehearse, re visualize what you want to be. Decades ago, if you had thought long and hard about who Jane Fonda would be at 73, what would she have looked like? I actually wrote a book about it, <laughs> and I quote it in the book. Um, I see myself walking outside, and it's pretty much what I am, except that I'm not married. In the description of myself that I wrote when I was 46, I was married. Now I'm shacked up, but the same thing, I, I, you know, we go walking, we laugh, we tell stories, my grandkids like to be with me, you know, I'm feisty. All the things that I projected that I wanted to be is what I am. That must feel pretty good. It does. It feels pretty good. And I'm glad I wrote it down so I'd know. Well, then let me ask you about looking back. I mean, one of the things you recommend readers do to prepare for the third act of life is a life review. So uh, can you sum up? For, first of all, what do you mean by life review? Pretend that you're an archaeologist. Sounds hard, a life review. Um, it, it can be hard. Yeah. It can be infinitely rewarding, though. You go back and you... You research yourself like you're a project, very objectively. And I don't mean then I did this and then I did that, but how did I feel? Why did I feel that way? Mm. Why did my parents make me feel that way? How were my grandparents to my parents? And, you know, I'm glad younger people are reading the book because it's good to interview your parents separately mm. so they don't tell the same old, same old um, when they're still alive. Nobody was alive in my family, so it was harder to do the research. But interview f friends of families, grandparents, parents, school kids. Try to feel in your body what it was like. And you will tend to discover, um, you'll view the incidents and people and events in your life through different eyes. What was the most difficult part of your life review? Well, my mother killed herself when I was 12, so it, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. And, you know, she wasn't famous, so it was harder to find people that knew her. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I thought it was my fault. And what I found in my life review, I was able to obtain the records or medical records that she, killed her, that she, that she uh, was sexually abused as a girl. Now, th this is, you know, one out of three women in the United States has been sexually abused, and it has a profound impact on the victim, on the children, 
even on the grandchildren. It can skip generations. Mm. Once I once I knew that, everything fell in place. In what way? What did, how did it inform your Well, your I life? had become an expert because I work with adolescents, and I had studied sexual abuse, and so I, know, I knew that it meant that you can't really be intimate with anybody. I mean, you can be... He, you can have therapy that will heal you, but in those days it didn't exist. You can't really love or be intimate with anyone. There's no trust. There's a tremendous amount of guilt, hatred of your body, um, cut, self-cutting. In those days it was plastic surgery. It was pr promiscuity. All these things that I discovered were true of her um, and have been true of me. Many of them became true of you. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so it's a way to say it... it it didn't really have anything to do with me. It wasn't my fault. And I can forgive her and I can forgive myself and move on. In the process of forgiving yourself, do you, does that mean everything? I mean, do you look back and lament anything that you did? Oh, yeah. You sure, do. Sure, but you, I don't live there. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I know what I did wrong and I, tr and I want to try to make up for it before I die. I mean, I was not a great parent early on. Um, you know, you say I'm going to do everything exactly differently than my parents, but then you end up not doing it differently. <laughs> I'm not starting know. to learn that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have children? No, no. Oh. I'm oh. just starting to fig find ways in which I'm similar to my father, and I wouldn't didn't think it's I was weird, gonna, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Not that my dad isn't great, but you know, yeah, it's yeah. A, you don't realize it <laughs> no. until you get a little I mean, bit I'm older. I stand like him sometimes, you know. You know, and then you have to really find out who he is. Your dad, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. who he is. And you'll understand a lot more about yourself. You emphasize that in order to live a fulfilling third act of life, it's important to mentor and help along the next generation. You talk about what Catherine Hepburn meant to you when you were working on On Golden Pond. What did you learn from Catherine Hepburn? Oh, my gosh. It, the, the, the word, by the way, is generativity. It was coined by Eric Erickson, and it is one of the components of a happy third act. Um, Catherine Hepburn took me under her wing and taught me a lot about the importance of facing your courage, um, being conscious of how you present in the world. You know, she, um, the way architects strengthen old arches is by adding weight to it. Catherine had weight, hmm. the weight of elderhood. You know, she took that seriously and it, it made her third act very resonant. I try to do the same thing as I work with young people. And then you were also close with Michael Jackson at that time, and he'd often come to the set to learn from Katharine Hepburn. So what, what was she trying to impart to him? She would, in between takes, she'd tell him, bring over a chair, Michael, and he'd pull over a chair, and she'd start telling him stories. He had a tape recorder. I wish that I knew where those tapes were. And she would tell him stories. One he brought of them, a tape recorder. He, Michael Jackson was taping tape Catherine Hepburn. That's right. Giving advice to Michael Jackson. That's right. Wow. He came there because he wanted to learn. He had just made The Wiz, and he wanted to do more movies, and he wanted to watch my father, wow. Henry Fonda, and Catherine Hepburn work. And he brought a tape recorder, and she, always self-conscious about her weighty archness, <laughs> told him stories, and embedded in all the stories would be this subtle lesson. You know, she wouldn't beat us over the head, but she would tell us stories that if we were ready for them would teach us stuff. Well, it's quite, it's quite interesting that it's he was beautiful. that fastidious about learning, too, that he would bring the tape recorder to learn from Catherine Hepburn. I love that story. He was fastidious. You know, I was so fascinated by the movie that was made, the, the, the one this after is it? he died, or This the, Is yeah, It, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you really, you didn't just see the performer performing, yeah. you saw the meticulousness uh, of the way he worked with the musicians. Jane, 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 in this book you say that when you look back at the movies you did in your late 40s, you can see the absence of joy in your own face, and you suggest that that's why you walked away from acting at the time. Do you need joy in life to act? Well, I don't know about other people, but I was so unhappy with myself as a woman that it was difficult for me. And in fact, the last movie I made was here in Toronto, of Stanley and Iris. Mm. It, it was really hard for me to get up in the morning. It was very difficult. And um, some people can act anyway, or maybe they have to. But uh, 
I had the workout to support me, so I didn't, and then Ted Turner came along. So I, I didn't have to act, but it was hard for me to be creative because I felt so shut down as a woman. In the past five years or so, you've returned to, to acting, first with Monster in Law, and this year your first French language movie in 40 years. Uh, what? And then another one that's coming to the Toronto Film Festival, that's right. Peace, you, Love, and Misunderstanding. Yeah. What, what has working on the screen again meant to you? Joy. I, I was almost through writing my memoirs when I realized I'm a really different person because of this, what I later found out is called a life review. I could find joy again in acting, <clears throat> and, 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 and I did, and I think that I'm, I think I'm better. I think I'm lighter, easier, it's more fun. So it's particularly good to be you right now, isn't it? It's very good to be me. Yeah. yeah. I love. See, even that's affirming, right? Yeah. Like to, to see somebody. I mentioned in the introduction that you, you you have exercise advice for older women. You have diet advice, spiritual advice, sexual advice. Um, when we were speaking earlier about the ch change, changing the uh, cultural idea of what it means to be older, where does sex fit in? Well, sex has always been a part of age. It's just that younger people think it's yucky, the idea that their <laughs> parents are getting it on. But uh, the fact is that older people do. Um, a lot of them have, sh you know, closed up shop down there. It's over, and that's fine. There's no one way to do your third act. If you don't have sex, that's you can still have a really good third act. But if you do want to remain sexually active, it's good to understand all the changes that are happening to your body, you know, especially men, and especially men who take certain kinds of medications. What do you do? And I have gone into great detail uh, because it, it was so much fun to research. Yeah, yeah. There, I learned a <laughs> lot. what you do. I, yeah. Yes, I bet you did. <laughs> I, I did, did too. <laughs> uh, and, and, then you, but, and you have a new man in your life. I do. Uh, but, but you see, I've never read a book like this that talks about that. It's hard to find books mm. that talk about pleasure when you're over 60, sexual pleasure. You know, you have to. So I just decided, well, why not really do it? You know. Well, I, one of the things I learned is it comes in a lot of different forms. People choose to explore it in different ways. All kinds yeah. of different ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the, the man who you won't I'm shacked up with. You, mm -hmm. You're shacked up with. You don't call him your boyfriend. You think that that sounds juvenile? He's not a, well, I'm 70, almost 74. I'm not going to call him my boyfriend. No? I call him my honey. Your honey. I yeah. don't want to say lover because that's too in your face. You know? <laughs> yeah. You say, but, but, and then you won't get married again. But you know, some people do. But why won't? Why not? Why did you react like that? I don't know. I the thought, the idea of it makes me feel claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> you figured out that you're this happy and you're not married, so uh, yeah. stick with a good thing, right. right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Huh. And also, I can just take off anytime I want. Do you regret being married in the past? No. No. Didn't feel claustrophobic then? No. No. Mm. It did a little bit. From time to time. <laughs> life feels claustrophobic from time to time. No, I, I'm, I've been married to three very, very interesting men. I'm friends with, well, one's dead, but before he died, I was friends with him, and I'm friends with the other two. Hmm. And um, I have grandchildren, and um, it's good. It's fun. We were really excited to have you in here to talk about this book. Before I let you go, tell me about this incident that happened with the publicity for this book. You were booked on QVC, this shopping network, to talk about this book. They canceled because of pressure from Vietnam War vets or from a lobby group. Is, it, is that still common for you to run up against resentment for your anti-Vietnam Not views? Not that often, but that was a very, it was a concentrated, organized effort um, that, that threatened QVC, and then they decided to cancel, and so I decided to fight back. Yeah. Because I have learned through experience that when you're attacked, especially if there's no basis for it, you fight back. And what happened was is it provided a, a forum that I didn't used to have to talk about Vietnam and my role in the anti-war movement. And I wrote on my blog a very long entry called The Truth About My Trip to Hanoi. I'd written it in my memoirs. I'd talked about it on 60 Minutes and other places, but social media... It's so great because you reach so many people. Right. And it began a dialogue that hadn't really happened before. And it was very beautiful. As the Bible said, it was turning a sow's ear into a silk purse. Do you still feel uh, misunderstood uh, amongst uh, well, some? Well, yeah, when there's it comes a lot of misunderstanding that's, that's, that's very deliberately uh, created there ever since the end of the 90s. 
there are these myths that are circulated on email and in mails among Republican circles, usually attached to some kind of fundraising effort, that have absolute lies, horrible, horrible lies, about things that they say I did that n never happened. Um, and I wanted to expose that mm. and, and then apologize again for the thing that I did that I should apologize for, which was sitting on a gun and being photographed, which was a complete, terrible, thoughtless mistake. I didn't even, I wasn't aware what I was doing. You are still a progressive, right? I yes. mean, the, the American military involvement in Iraq is winding down, but that's a war that overall didn't generate the same cultural reaction, the same antipathy as Vietnam did. Why not? Well, it's, it's, it's hard, partly because we were attacked. And the fact of being attacked allowed... Not by Iraq, but it didn't matter. <laughs> by people who weren't even in Iraq. Right, but yeah. f in terms of the American psyche, you know, it was, it was easier to fool us. <laughs> we, were, we were attacked, and somehow uh, Saddam was behind it, number one. Number two, there's no draft. S and I think, you know, it's possible that, that I was used, I mean... The subliminal message may be, and this may be why the lies are useful to the those people who wage those kind of wars, is if you're if you oppose the war, you're going to end up like Hanoi Jane, hmm. you know, you're going to be you're going to be against the troops, you know. I I mean I I made coming home. I worked with American soldiers. I probably know more about what the combat was like than most, but it's the perception, and maybe that scares people. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a different time. It's, everything is different. It's, hopefully we'll learn our lesson. <laughs> if life after 60 is a third act, whose third act do you look for, uh, to, for inspiration? I, I don't look to anybody's. I just look to myself. And, um, you, you did know, look to Catherine Hepburn. But I'm, that... I'm a, well, I'm the, I'm the age that she was when we did on Golden Pond. And I, uh, she was not an easy person to be with. She was a prickly person. But, man, she taught me. And I am so grateful for that. But I would not want to be her. Well, let me ask you this. As you enter, say, the next decade in your third act, if, um, if people talk about Jane Fonda, how would you hope that they would characterize you? She made sense of her life, and that helped me with my own. I think that's probably the biggest gift that I can leave behind, is that for various reasons, I, I was able to tell my life, and I think this new book, Prime Time, is a second step in that process in such a way that people keep putting the book down to think about themselves, which is really what I want. And, I mean, I was just today at a book signing, and the number of people who came up to me and said, your memoirs changed my life. Mm. Your memoirs made it possible for me to go on, that kind of thing. I think this book is going to have, you know, somewhat the same effect, and I think it's m the biggest contribution that I've made. It's really great to get to talk to you again. Thank you for it's this. It's good to see you again. When will the next time be? <sighs> Hopefully uh, <laughs> soon, in the, within the third act, once more. <laughs>